Good evening, friends, and welcome back for night number 20 of the Prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Again, I'm your host, Jeff Conkin, this evening. Um, tonight's topic is Babylon's Buffet. Now, this topic has become near and dear to my heart over the last few years as I had a health scare of my own, um, and I think you're going to find it interesting this evening. But before we begin, as usual, we have some wonderful special music for you. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody he is traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. Then my living shall not be in vain, then my living shall not be in vain. If I can help somebody as I pass along, then my living shall not be If I can do my duty as a Christian ought, if I can bring back beauty in a world abroad, if I can spread love's message that our Master taught, then my living shall not be in vain, then my living shall not be in vain, then my living shall not be in vain, if I can help somebody as I pass along, then my living shall not be in vain. That was some wonderful special music. Thank you very much. Again, tonight's topic, Babylon's Buffet. But before we begin, as always, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we open your word tonight, I pray that you will send your Holy Spirit to bless our session, our discussion. As we open your word, give us understanding. Help us to see clearly your truth in your word, because we know your word is the truth, and we can always depend on it. We thank you, and we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. King Nebuchadnezzar besieged the city of Jerusalem. Thousands of Jews were taken away captive to Babylon. The king instructed his, his servant, Ashpenaz, to select gifted young men from among the Jewish captives who would come to the palace for three years to learn the language and wisdom of Babylon so that they could serve the king. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah caught the attention of Ashpenaz and were taken to the king's palace. 
The problem was the menu of rich meat and wine appointed for the young men contained many items forbidden by God's word. It says in Daniel 1.8, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. Daniel 1.12 says, please, please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Without wanting to appear ungrateful, Daniel asked if he and his three friends could be given a vegetarian diet to eat and water to drink. <clears throat> At first, the king's servants resisted their request. You can't stay healthy eating that like that, he exclaimed. You'd get sick, and then the king would have my head. But Daniel gently persisted, suggesting a trial period of ten days, after which their visible health could be compared with the young men who ate from the royal cafeteria. This plan was agreed upon, and for ten days the four young Hebrews drank water and ate a simple vegetarian diet. It says in Daniel 1.15, And at the end of ten days, their counter countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. At the end of the trial period, Daniel and his three friends appeared as it said, fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which ate the king's meat. Three years later, these four young men were tested by King Nebuchadnezzar. And it was declared that they were ten times brighter than all the wise men in Babylon. The Bible tells us that Daniel lived to be approximately a hundred years old. So friends... What helped give Daniel and his friends such profound wisdom, health, and long life? Our session this evening will help make the answer to that question very clear. So let's get started with question number one. <clears throat> what was the original diet that God designed for humans? Genesis 1.29 and God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is in, on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Number two, after Adam and Eve sinned, what supplemental food did God add to their diet? Find this in Genesis 3.18. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. The original diet for the human race was a vegetarian diet of fruits, grains, and nuts. God added vegetables to Adam and Eve's diet after they sinned and could no longer eat from the tree of life. Let me tell you the story of Jeanette and Alan Murray. They're from Melbourne, Australia. These crazy kids decided that, that they wanted to run around the entire continent of Australia and the island of Tasmania. Now this is not a short run. This is a 10,000 mile journey. That would, and they wanted to do it in a year. So this would require them to run about a length of a marathon every day for an entire year. So, this couple chose a year of running, in part to promote a raw, vegan, vegetarian diet, which Jeanette believes was instrumental in curing her from breast cancer a decade earlier. So, on January 1, 2003, off they went, rising each day at 4 a.m. to avoid the heat and running at least 26.2 miles every day for an entire year, circling Australia and Tasmania. 
Along the way, they consumed 11,000 bananas between them, several hundred green smoothies, fruit salads, oranges, avocado, and many gallons of vegetable juice. On New Year's Eve, they arrived in Melbourne, completing their 365th run. And in case that wasn't enough, they followed it up with one additional marathon on January 1st, 2014, to set a new Guinness World Record for the most consecutive marathons. By the way, did I happen to mention that Jeanette is 64 years old and Alan is 68 years old? That's crazy. Several years ago, I did a half marathon. And I don't say that to brag, because it just about killed me. Did you know the Bible teaches original, the original diet of mankind was vegetarian? Number three, is God concerned with our physical health? See what the Bible has to say. Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Third John 1, 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. The Bible teaches that our physical health is extremely important to God. Jesus spent as much time healing as he did teaching. There are several Bible principles we can follow to improve our health and lengthen our lives. John 10.10 10 says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Notice the guy in the picture? That is George Banana Blair. Having an active lifestyle, here we see him barefoot water skiing. He did that and also snor snowboarding until the age of 92. Amazing. Number four, God promised the children of Israel that if they would serve and obey him, he would remove all sickness from them. Did he keep his promise? Let's see, in Psalm 105, 37, it says, He brought them forth, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Just imagine, when God's people came into the promised land, there was not one sick or feeble person in the whole nation. Why is health, our health so important to God? It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Therefore glorify God in your body. In Romans 1, 21, Present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God wants our bodies to be his holy dwelling place. Therefore, we must choose to make them a wholesome place for his residence. Can our bodies really be a dwelling place for God if we continually fill it with junk? Number six, what is a good Bible rule for healthful living? 1 Corinthians 10.31 whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. We should strive to, to live so that all of our habits, even our eating and drinking, will glorify God. 
Seven, should Christians use alcoholic beverages? Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Alcoholic beverages are clearly forbidden by Scripture. The word wine in the Bible can mean either fermented or unfermented grape juice. The same is true for the word cider today. Proverbs 23, verses 29 through 32, gives the Bible description of fermented wine. And God says that we should not even look at it. The only wine Christians should use is new wine, which is unfermented, sweet grape juice. I can hear some of you out there already saying, but wine, it has health benefits. It's good for your body. Well, friends, research has proven that grape juice, unfermented, gives you the exact same benefits. Some of those benefits are reducing the risk of blood clots, reducing the bad cholesterol, preventing damage to blood vessels in your heart. It says in Isaiah 65, verse 8, new wine is found in the cluster, meaning the grape juice. Alcohol is addictive. It destroys brain cells. It dramatically affects our ability to reason. Number eight, what will God do to those who defile their bodies? Do you not know that you, you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. That's 1 Corinthians three sixteen and 17. Any substance or unhealthful practice that damages the body or shortens one's life must be laid aside. Suicide by degrees is still suicide. This of course includes harmful drugs such as tobacco in all its forms and the many drinks that contain a popular yet highly detrimental drug called caffeine. God says that he will destroy people who knowingly wreak havoc upon their body temples. Exodus 20, verse 13 says, Thou shalt not kill. This is the sixth commandment, and this includes yourself. Tobacco is the second most costly drug addiction in North America. Other top addictions include alcohol, opioids, heroin, marijuana. Number nine, what mammals does God permit humans to eat? We're shifting our focus now to our diet. Leviticus 11 verse three says, whatsoever parteth the hoof and is cloven footed and cheweth the cud. To make things simple for us, God has placed all living creatures into two categories, clean and unclean. He permits us to eat those that are clean, but has declared the unclean creatures to be unfit for food. All mammals that are clean have two characteristics. They must have cloven hooves and chew the cud. For example, a pig has cloven hooves, but does not chew its cud, so it is unclean. So what types of fish and seafood are clean? Leviticus 11, verse 9. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters, whatsoever, whatsoever hath fins and scales, them shall ye eat. 
But it all in the in the sea or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. Most fish are clean for food. However, eels, sharks, and catfish are among the exceptions. All creatures in the water that do not have both fins and scales are unclean and should not be eaten. Examples include shellfish, turtles, frogs, shrimp, and oysters. Okay, which birds are unclean? Back to Leviticus 11, verses 15 and 16. Every raven after his kind, and the owl, and the night hawk, and the cutco, and the hawk after his kind. The list in Leviticus 11 indicates that birds of prey, carrion, and fish eaters are unclean. However, all the foraging birds, such as quail, chickens, and turkeys, are clean. Are the laws about clean and unclean animals part of Moses' ceremonial law, which ended at the cross? Genesis 7, 1 and 2 says, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, and of beasts that are not clean by two. No, God... God's categories of clean and unclean beasts have existed since creation. Noah was told to take clean beasts into the ark by sevens and unclean by two. This was long before Moses' law. Galatians 6 verse 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Does God say that eating unclean food is a serious offense? For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves. To go to the gardens after an idol in the midst of eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. It's Isaiah 66, 17. The Bible is too plain and clear to misunderstand. Friends, God has given us a perfect instruction book, the Bible. Not to take away things on this earth that we enjoy, but to give us a life more abundant than we ever imagined. For me personally, it, if it's what God asks us to do, it's what I want to do. What about Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10? Many have tried to use this vision to justify eating unclean animals. They say it proves that Jesus taught his disciples it was acceptable to eat any living creature. However, each time the sheep came down and Peter was asked to kill and eat the unclean animals, he responded, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean says that in Acts 10, 14. Notice that even after three and a half years of listening to Jesus' teaching, Peter had not received the slightest hint or impression that eating unclean food was permissible. It is also interesting to note that in his vision, Peter never took anything to eat from the sheet.
Acts 10, 28. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Peter's vision of the sheet was never intended to sanctify the eating of unclean animals. Peter himself explains the meaning of the vision in, in this verse 28. Again, in verse 34, Peter summarizes the point of the vision when he said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. God's message to Peter had to do with cleansing people, not animals. This vision was given to impress the Jewish disciples that they should not call the Gentiles unclean, and that the gospel was to be freely proclaimed to all the peoples of the world. What is a good basic health rule for Christians? Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Temperance means completely avoiding things that are harmful and using moderation in things that are good. Again, if God says it's unclean and it's not fit to eat, who are we to question that? Are the Bible health principles still practical today? This should hit pretty close to home these days. Quarantine procedures control contagious diseases. It says in Leviticus 13.46, He shall be unclean. All the days he has a sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean, and he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Sounds pretty familiar. Human body waste should be buried. It says in Deuteronomy 23, 12 through 13. Also, you shall have a place outside the camp where you may go out, and you shall have an implement among your equipment. And when you sit down outside, you shall dig with it and turn and cover your refuse. Washing the body and clothing controls germs. Leviticus 17, 15, and 16 says, And every person who eats what died naturally or what was torn by beasts, whether he is a native or of your country, or a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes and bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. Then he shall be clean. But if he does not wash them or bathe his body, then he shall bear his guilt. Moral living prevents sexual diseases. Colossians 3, 5, and 6. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Animal fat should not be eaten. Leviticus 3.17 this shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. In all your dwellings you shall eat neither fat nor blood. Hatred and bitterness is detrimental to one's health. Leviticus 19, 17, and 18. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Overeating is harmful. Proverbs 23, 2. And put a knife to your throat if you are a man given to appetite. Our bodies need proper rest. This comes from Mark 6, 31. And he said to them, Come aside 
by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going. They did not even have time to eat. Importance of work. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. A positive attitude is good medicine. Proverbs 17.22 says, A merry heart does good, like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bone, bones. <clears throat> Parents' habits affect their children. Deuteronomy 12.25 You shall not eat it, that it may go well with you and your children after you when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. The health laws God gave his people thousands of years ago were scientifically far ahead of their time. Only in recent years have we recognized how truly great the benefits that they offer. Will people in heaven kill and eat animals? Isaiah 65, 25 says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. Revelation 21, 4, There shall be no more death. All that Adam and Eve lost when sin entered will be restored in God's new kingdom, including the original vegetarian diet. There will be no slaughtering or devouring of animals in the new earth. You might be asking, how can I make diet and health changes that will please the Lord? They shall take away all the detestable things thereof. Ezekiel eleven eighteen. 18. And I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you that they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them. When we decide to obey God's health laws, he puts a new spirit within us that will give us the power needed to live healthfully. You can also find this in John 1, verse 12. God honored Daniel and his friends for keeping his health laws, which are a very important part of Christian living. Are you willing to follow the health principles in God's word and to present your body as a holy temple where his spirit may reside? I hope you are willing to do that, friends. Let's have a, a word of prayer as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again we thank you for your instruction book, the Bible, where you even go into what we should put into our bodies, Lord. And this may be hard for some people to hear as, you know, there's a reason that things that are unclean taste so good to some people. I believe Satan has made them very tasty for that purpose. But we know that through you we are capable of anything and that we can change to a healthy lifestyle that will be pleasing in your sight, Lord. We just want our bodies to be a clean temple for you to dwell in that our minds will be clear, that we will be able to understand your word more clearly, and that we will be ready when you come to take us home, Lord. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Coming up on Friday evening, um, Brother Dave will be bringing us Voice in the Wilderness. As a very good presentation. You're going to love it. Um, Sunday, 
Proving the Prophets. Back here Tuesday night, a jar of oil, and then, can you believe it? Our final presentation next Thursday, Goal of the Godly. And as usual, if you will have a prayer request or you have a question of, over something we've covered tonight or during any of the presentations, please call us or text, or text us or email us. Um, our number is 919-533-5150. Press option 1 if you want to leave a voicemail. I know that tonight's topic has been a tough one for some people, so... If you're struggling with it, please contact us. We'd love to talk about it with you. Um, but again, we thank you for joining us and hope you have a wonderful evening and we'll see you tomorrow night for tomorrow night's session. Have a good evening.